Good morning, Bucknutters. It is Thursday, January 7th, 2021. I am Dan Rubin. This is the Bucknuts Morning 5 and tons of change. Today is a megapod. In light of the excellent football that's going on, we felt the need to live up to that standard. We'll be joined in succession by Steve Wiltfong to talk recruiting and what he thinks of the Bama-Ohio State tussle. We will then move on to the Athletics' Dane Brugler, the premier NFL draft source out there to talk all Buckeyes when it comes to the draft. And we will finish with a sit-down with JT Tuamolau. Possibly the only recruit left in Ohio State's class of 2021 board. Very interestingly, it seems like it's going to be a Ohio State-Alabama tussle. So we know one guy who'll be watching with eager eyes on Monday. I know another one. His name is Steve Wiltfong, director of recruiting for 24-7 Sports. Steve, how goes it? Going well, guys. It is going well here. Smoothie in hand in my Pacers Cup. Pacers with another... Big win over the Rockets last night after disposing of the Pelicans in exciting fashion earlier this week. How are y'all? Doing great. You picked Clemson, though you gave Ohio State a good shot. What was your thought on the game? Man, it was a dominant effort. You know, Uh, after the first couple series, there was no question who the better football team on the field was, and that was the Ohio State Buckeyes. And so, what an exciting win for your guys' program to be back in the national championship to win a semifinal because there were actually people out there talking about Ohio State not being in the top tier of college football. This is just how the, the, the coverage of sports is just ridiculous these days where it's crystal ball or bust. And it's just just a sad state because many of the people that write these articles don't hold themselves to the same standard in their own house of how they attack you know, uh, their day. But uh, so for Ohio State to like not be considered on the same level as as Alabama or Clemson because they hadn't been in the national title game in a a while is just crazy to me. And and in a while is what, how many years? (laughs) Five? So it's just, just but uh, Ohio State validating themselves to the ridiculous in in, in the title game. And, uh, you know, We'll see what they can do against an Alabama team that is obviously loaded on offense. They were averaging 48 points a game going into the Notre Dame game. I think that Notre Dame was able to get off the field a little bit against them. Uh, it was a rough first quarter for the Irish, an embarrassing one, uh, but they settled in and and uh, you know, had a chance to cut it to one score. The game was never in doubt, but I think that Ohio State can look at the film and, and, and see some things there. To, to maybe give them a chance on defense to slow down what was the most prolific offense in college football this year. And then on the flip side, you know, Alabama's defense hasn't been, you know, a, a dominant force. You know, they've given up big plays and, and, and they've given up some points in some games this year, Old Miss and Florida being the two to obviously point to. And, and, and Notre Dame just didn't have the playmakers to, to have big plays on the perimeter against Alabama. Ohio State does. So while I'm going to pick Alabama to win the game, it's the same thing. You know, Ohio State has the personnel to hurt uh, hurt uh, Alabama and, and, and hit some big plays on them and, and, and score some points. And, you know, the way they were able to just make it difficult on Trevor Lawrence and, and Clemson after Clemson was, you know, coming off a, a big performance offensively in the ACC title game. Uh, I, I thought was impressive. So, you know, we'll see if Ohio State's up to the challenge defensively against an amazing Alabama offense that's got three generational skill players in, in Najee Harris, Devontae Smith, and then they're going to welcome Jalen Waddle back. And you guys have never heard me say generational on the show. I'm not one of those writers that deems six guys generational every year. But those guys are really, really good. And you go back to the Alabama-Georgia game earlier this year where you said where, where Georgia – for the recruiting rankings has the most talented roster in college football. And that may be true uh, when you're looking up and down the 85, but that doesn't matter if, the, if you take in the first three or four guys on Alabama's roster and, and uh, uh, those, those three guys at the top and then Mac Jones being a Heisman finalist, seeing the game in slow motion, being able to extend plays himself and, and make things happen when he's under duress. They've been impressive. Let's step into your 3-1 fastball wheelhouse. Cruton, 
top offensive lineman in the class of 2022 released his top three. Zach Rice out of the Lynchburg, Virginia area. His profile for a long time said North Carolina, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Alabama, warm. When he came out with his top three, there was no Alabama. The latest on Zach Rice. This is a recruitment that's going to be fluid. He's Zach Rice, I talked to him on the phone last night. He said he's known where he wants to go for a long time, but you talk to sources around him and they don't think it's going to end anytime soon. So I don't necessarily know what to believe. Zach Rice told me he was in the Ohio State group chat. He's not in the Ohio State group chat anymore. This is just a, you know, this is a, a recruitment, in my opinion, that's going to be fluid. He definitely wants to play with Gunnar Givens. Uh, I'm not caught up in right now what what could happen t- tomorrow in this recruitment because I still think that there's going to be a long game with Zach Rice. Definitely feels like it's going to be a roller coaster ride, and it is interesting with kids that aren't going to go to their regional school. Actually, the regional school for Lynchburg would be more Virginia Tech. It's in the western part of the state of Virginia, but when it's three schools not from your state, it can be a little bit of a wild, wild west. So we'll ride the roller coaster with that one. He's worth it. Tell me about Dallin Hayden. Dallin Hayden rushed for over 2,000 yards as a junior, one of the top players in the state of Tennessee. He's one of the top running backs on Ohio State's board. He put out a top four recently, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Oregon, and Tennessee. Hmm. I think there's two at the top, Notre Dame and Ohio State. And I think that uh, there was a t- I think at the start of the season, Notre Dame had the edge. I think that that's evened out at, at this point. And I think Ohio State's recruiting him harder than Notre Dame is. He, he's a guy with good speed that can break tackles and, and has good vision. And, and he's a guy that can take, take, take it the distance. And he also has the ability to catch the football. And, and so he's, you know, in Ohio State's opinion, he's one of the premier backs in this class. And they're recruiting him as such. You know, led by Tony Alford, but Brian Hartline's heavily involved in this recruitment, as is Ryan Day. So they have three, three, uh, uh, head, three assistant coaches recruiting down and hate it. The plan is to take some visits in April once the dead period's lifted and then commit soon after that. Again, I think Ohio State is, is the team that's kind of got some momentum because I thought Notre Dame led going into the fall. And, and Notre Dame's still in a good position here uh, for Dallin Hayden as well. Uh, but I just kind of get a feeling that Ohio State's the, the team to watch right now. Another name you brought to me, Cam Dewberry. Yeah, Cam Dewberry is a, a big offensive lineman from the state of Texas who recently, you know, narrowed his list of offers to 10 schools. And within that group, there were there were three standing out, uh, Oklahoma, Texas A&M, and, and Ohio State. And, you know, for Ohio State, he called him a childhood favorite. And, you know, just says he, it's an unexplainable feeling that he gets when he watches them play. So he's going to get to watch them play one more time. And it, it was just a, he was a fan of them before he went through the process. Uh, that national title in 2014 uh, is, is something that hit home with him. And uh, he said that Ohio State's a school that introduced him to college football and, and it's a dream school of his. So if Ohio State's pushing for Cam Dewberry, and a lot of these recruiting boards are fluid early in the process, um, but that, it seems like they'll have a great chance at, at the young man from uh, at a, at a Cosita, uh Texas. And, uh, um, you know, we'll see where that one goes. Let's finish with this. I want to talk Texas real quick. When I talk to other people about Ohio State's future recruiting, the first question I get is, do you think they'll be able to hold on to Quinn Ewers now that Steve Sarkeesian has taken over at Texas? Before we take a break and have Dan Brugler come on, what is your thought on that? Well, I haven't heard anything to make me worried that Ohio State's in danger of losing Quinn Ewers. He loves Ohio State. He loves Corey Dennis. He loves Ryan Day. They have a farm near Columbus. Um, he knew Coach Sarkeesian um, at Alabama. He could have went to Alabama. You know, Alabama was recruiting him. So they had a report there. I know that changes with, with Coach Sark going to Texas. And, look, Texas will have played a whole football season by the time uh, Quinn Ewers puts pen to paper for Ohio State. So I guess you never know. But, you know, everything – I just say you never know because that's just what recruiting is. But regarding Quinn Ewers, uh, I haven't heard anything to make me think that he's going to be anything but a Buckeye by the time he puts pen to paper. We appreciate five-star talent Steve Wolfong joining us, and we'll be back with another five-star talent in Dane Brugler. As promised, we are joined by the best in the business. Dane Brugler of The Athletic is here to talk NFL draft and Buckeyes. Dane, an Ohio native, 
What do you make of the season Ohio State has had culminating in a championship tussle with the Crimson Tide? It's been fascinating to watch these last few months, um, you know, from not thinking that they were able, going to be able to play to, uh, you know, all the efforts to get on the field. Uh, you know, everyone knew that the Big Ten coming back, uh, one of the main motivations is Ohio State because of the team they had, the talent on that roster, and the just the potential of where, what the season could be. And then, you know, you kind of against Indiana, against, uh, you know, Northwestern, it just kind of was, well, you know, is this team really that good? Are they a championship level team? I mean, they're good enough to uh, win the Big Ten in a shortened season, but could they really make any noise in the playoff? And heck, I'd say they did that against Clemson. I mean, just a, an unbelievable performance that I think uh, Ohio State fans are still drunk on. And I don't blame them at all because it was that great of a performance. Um, and one that was not expected. Um, Who did you I don't pick? think. Oh, I thought I, I didn't think Ohio State's defense would be able to stop Clemson. I knew Ohio State's offense would be able to score because Clemson's defense is just not that great. So I thought it would be a 42 35 type of game. And I just didn't think Ohio State's defense would be able to uh, you know, be up to the challenge. And I was 100% wrong. Um, now, the secondary, I still have major questions. But Credit to the linebackers, the, the amount of experience they have in that unit. The defensive line played out of their minds. Um, and Clemson's offensive line is average at best. And the Ohio State defensive line, it's like they feasted on that. And, I mean, Trevor Lawrence could not get comfortable at all because he didn't have any time to throw. And Travis Etienne had 30 yards rushing, uh, very little uh, as a pass catcher. So, I mean, credit to that Ohio State uh, front seven for how they performed and just really, just really limited that Clemson offense. And then, I mean, how do you not talk about Justin Fields? Uh, he is such a fascinating topic from my perspective, because I'm, you know, I'm not focused on the college players and how they perform as college players. I'm, I'm focused on these college players and projecting them forward, focused on traits, focusing on, okay, how do these guys project to the next level and with Justin Fields, I mean, obviously a pr supreme talent. Always has been, always will be. That's not the question. But when you're talking about a top three, top five talent, it, it's you're gonna there's gonna be nitpicks and trying to figure out exactly how good are you, where are you in your development. And uh, with Justin Fields, okay, the first three games, it was like, uh, all right, you know, he's headed in the right direction. He's he because of watching him over the summer, and I think I've mentioned this before on the pod. Uh, you know, I was more impressed with Ryan Day than I was Justin Fields over the summer. And that wasn't necessarily a knock on Fields. It was more just, okay, Ryan Day as a play caller um, is just is masterful. And that, is, you know, is everything for a quarterback. And so in the first three games this year, it was like maybe Justin Fields is catching up. He's getting better. He's shown development. That's what, exactly what you want to see if you're a scout. But then against Indiana, he just looked lost at times. Uh, even against, say, Michigan State, he just did not look comfortable um, against Northwestern. And, you know, people will say, well, no, Chris Olave, his thumb was, you know, and that, that's, that's, those are facts. But it, still, when you're talking about a potential top three pick, you want to see a quarterback that's as talented as Justin Fields be able to overcome just not having his top guy. It's not like Ohio State doesn't have other talented wideouts. So, you know, it, a lot of doubt, a lot of, a lot of concerns with Fields, not as a, you know, a talent because he's still going to be a top 10 pick, but where does he fall in the pecking order of the quarterbacks in this draft class? And so it's just a really fascinating conversation because he goes out against Clemson and plays not only above average, he plays the best game of his life. And to do it on that stage against a quality opponent, just a, a tremendous, tremendous outing from him and something that's really, really created a lot of buzz in uh, NFL scouting circles. Do you expect guys like Fields and Trevor Lawrence and BYU's Zach Wilson, do you expect these guys to work out at the Combine? I, I really don't know uh, because I don't even know what the Combine is going to look like. I don't. Uh, we're going to have a regular Combine this year? I, I don't know. There's a lot of things up in the air. The NFL has not officially announced what the Combine is going to be this year. Um, and so – there's a lot of things that are up in the air, um, and especially this year with uh, the pandemic. I mean, at this time last year, 
you know, uh, the stuff hadn't hit the fan yet in terms of the, the pandemic. And so everything was business as usual this year. It's, it's, even though it feels like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, we're not there yet. And so this pre-draft process is, I'm not sure what it's going to look like. And so really, if I'm an Ohio state, uh, prospect, and I know I'm going to be part of the 2021 NFL draft, I have to view Monday night against Alabama as the start of my combine. Uh, because I don't know, uh, you know, what the rest of the pre-draft process is going to look like. I don't know what the combine is going to look like. I don't know what the, you know, these workouts and will I be able to travel to uh, different facility, NFL facilities around the, the league uh, for pre-draft meetings. I, I just don't know. So I'm going to treat this national title game against a, a big time opponent as really the start of my draft process. If they did have a traditional combine, how would you expect fields to perform? You know, I mean, Fields is the type of quarterback that I think should do really well in that type of setting because he's, you know, a big, strong passer, a very good athlete. You know, if he if he tests and he does all the the, uh, the agility testing, he should test extremely well, you know, run somewhere in the. Uh, you know, a four, five, five, the four, six, two, somewhere in that range uh, at, you know, 225 pounds or whatever he ends up being. Um, you know, I think he's very, he's naturally accurate, which we saw, uh, you know, against Clemson, his ability just to set and fire, he could put the ball on his guy. And that's something that, you know, we'd be able to see in a, you know, shorts and a t-shirt throwing to targets, uh, you know, type of setting like the combine. So if Fields does go to the combine, he does perform, I, I think he'd do very well. Where do you have him currently projected in the draft? I assume you're like the rest that believes Trevor Lawrence is a guaranteed number one overall pick. Yes, uh, and that's that, that's always been the case. Um, I, I thought maybe towards the, the start of this year that, okay, maybe Justin Fields can close the gap a little bit. Um, but I mean, Trevor Lawrence is, he, he's not a generational quarterback prospect, but he is a generational talent and, you know, it, it's just everything you want. A quarterback is there, uh, Ohio state's defense with the pressure they put on him. And I don't think we talk enough about how Clemson missing, uh, their offensive coordinator, how, how big of a deal that was, uh, for, in terms of the Clemson offense and not to take anything away from the Buckeyes defense, cause they play outstanding, but not having that, that Clemson off the offensive co uh, play caller, that mattered in a big, big way um, for Trevor Lawrence. And so, um, you know, it, it, after Trevor Lawrence, that's where it gets really interesting. Um, I've, I've said all along, all this season, that quarterbacks two, three, and four in this draft, uh, there's not going to be a consensus. Justin Fields will not be the consensus two or three or four. Same thing with Zach Wilson. Same thing with Trey Lance out of North Dakota State. Teams will have different preferences and stack these guys differently based off of their team, what they're looking for at the position, uh, you know, maybe what their window is, how far away are they? Do they have the patience to bring in a guy that needs a year uh, of development? I mean, there's so many variables here from team to team that will determine the order of these quarterbacks come off the board. We've only seen, uh, you know, three quarterbacks go in the top five twice uh, since 1960. Good chance that happens again this year. We've only had a, a four quarterbacks drafted top 10 once since 1960. Good chance that happens this year. So there's a lot of intrigue with the quarterbacks at the top of this draft. And Justin Fields is right there in the middle of it. And it's, you know, I, I know I had Buckeye fans, uh, you know, a little upset with me when I, my, I've only done one mock draft so far. That was back in November. And I had Zach Wilson, number two. Uh, and, you know, I it surprised a lot of people. I, that was not a common thought back in November. But talking to people, uh, NFL scouts and guys in the league, that's how they were feeling that they were thinking, okay, Zach, he, he's really emerged as a favorite to be that number two uh, quarterback off the board. Then Justin Fields goes out and plays a game like we've never seen him play before. And now, okay, it, what are you going to do in the national title game? If Justin Fields goes out and has another performance similar to that, then we're talking about Deshaun Watson and exactly what he did his final year at Clemson. He was up and down a little bit. Yeah, a lot of interceptions, a lot of uh, up and down play for him uh, during the regular season. But then the playoff, you know, I, I don't have to remind Ohio State fans in the semifinals what that game looked like. And then uh, in the national title game, beating Alabama uh, with the, that last second drive, throwing a touchdown to Hunter Renfro. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where if you give scouts uh, truth serum, they'll tell you 
that yes, body of work is very important, but how you perform on the big stage and you know, that type of environment against a quality opponent that matters. And that weighs just a little bit differently. So all eyes are going to be on fields on Monday night to see how he performs and see if he can keep that momentum going. I don't think fields will catch Lawrence, but I do believe he will clearly separate from the pack. If for no other reason that he has no discernible weakness when you break him down in terms of his size, his speed, his accuracy, his strength, his IQ. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. There's just no doubt mm-hmm. in my mind that standing next, and I love Zach Wilson, but just they're not the same prospect. I thought Fields played great against Clemson, but I did mm-hmm. not feel like he was playing above his head. He did play poorly in some of the other games, but he's played that way before. And when he's at his best, he does feel just completely unstoppable. That's going to be intoxicating for at least one personnel guy. No doubt. No doubt. My biggest thing with Fields has always been his passing vision because, uh, and this is, it's kind of goes back with with Ryan Day. He makes it so easy for his quarterbacks because of the way he can uh, find the vulnerable matchup, uh, find the void in the defense that Justin Fields a lot of time, he doesn't need to go through his reads because that that preferred read, that initial read, it's there. It's open. And even against Clemson, watching the tape, he was staring down his guys uh, in that game. It's just the Clemson defense couldn't do anything about it because Fields was so precise with his throws and uh, the, the receivers were getting open. So his ability, but in the NFL, it'll just be tougher. His ability to go one to two to three, use the entire field, uh, that's something where he's just not, and it doesn't mean he can't do it. I'm not saying he can't do it. It's just he's not proven in that area yet uh it, consistently and so that's that's where the concern is with him but it's not like that's a more glaring concern than some things going on with Zach Wilson or Trey Lance I mean each one of these guys after Lawrence has their own thing that you kind of worry about but it, it's I, I tell you what that there's a lot on the line for for fields on Monday night uh, every, all 32 teams are going to be glued to that game just to see what happens there's so many prospects on that game uh on on the field for that game it's, it's gonna be a lot of fun I just think Fields has grown up being able to run away from every single team he's played against. Mm -hmm. And he's got to get a little of the running quarterback out of his system. Absolutely. I think that given the chance to expand that, he may not be turnkey from day one, but long term, if he gets in the right situation, and by the way, getting in the right situation, Dwayne Haskins, (laughs) is essential. It is so important that uh, if Fields does that, I think he's going to have you know, just an incredible career. All right, let's move on. If anybody has had a more meteoric rise than this guy, someone's going to have to clue me in. Trey Sermon started the season, the Oklahoma transfer, and I told you before the show, after a few games, I wasn't even sure he was a college football player anymore. It looked like a guy who injuries had taken his career. We remember how great he was when Oklahoma came here with Baker Mayfield and beat the Buckeyes. And I told you I was bummed out after the game. Sermon was younger. He was a freshman, younger, faster, better than anyone we had in the backfield. Came here, and like we said, non-inspiring beginning. I will credit one of the 24-7 network dudes. He's turned into Earl Campbell. How is that possible? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think when you factor in just how unprecedented this offseason was with, especially for Sermon, because he was coming off uh, an injury this offseason, and, you know, there's limited practice reps with his new team. He has to learn a new playbook. Um, You know, there's just a lot of new things going on for him, his teammates, the coaches, everything. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, watching him earlier this year, he just did not look like the same guy we saw at Oklahoma. Um, and it just, it was really, really confusing. And then the last three games, my goodness, he's averaging 9.1 yards per carry, uh, the last three games, seven, he's rushed 70 times. So it's not like he's rushed, you know, a handful of times he's rushed 70 times and he's averaging over nine yards a carry. That's just unbelievable. And he's doing it against some pretty good defenses, Michigan state, Northwestern Clemson. I, I mean, just a really impressive run here. Can he keep it up against Alabama? Uh, we're going to see. But the determination that he's showing, uh, the body balance, he's always falling forward. He's just in the zone. Like, he looks like a man on the mission. Like He, he just – when he's running, he he feels like, you know, the, the first guy, uh, you know, he, he's like, okay, well, I'll beat this guy. I'm going to start looking at the second guy now because he, he knows he can make a guy miss in space. He knows he can lower his pads and, you know, take on contact. 
just a and credit to the offensive line as well because he's running through some some big holes at times. But Trey Sermon, I, I just everything is clicking for him at the right time, and it's just an unbelievable run that has been a big part of this offense. Has helped Justin Fields. Um, it, it's really helped you know just move the sticks. And so, if you're Trey Sermon, you're you're looking at your draft stock, and it's it's pointing north. Where did you have him heading into the season, and where would you draft him today? Coming into the season, he was somewhere in the mid rounds. Um, you know, you thought, okay, early day three, fourth round, uh, maybe fifth round. Then uh, after the first three games, you're like, okay, maybe he's a late round pick, uh, maybe. And then uh, after these last three games, okay, now he's a guy that's going to push for top 100 status uh, based off of how the medicals are. Um, you know, it, because he's a guy that can help you out in the passing game. Very good at screen player because of his vision in the open field. Um, just that, that I mentioned that, that body balance that he plays with is so, is so different because he, he is able to wriggle off the hook, uh, you know, because of his ability to, uh, the contact balance to take on, uh, tacklers and not lose momentum, not, uh, immediately go to the ground. It's just, it's a really unique trait that is going to translate to the next level. Um, and so, you know, uh, Travis Etienne, Najee Harris, those are the top two senior backs this year. And then I took Trey Sermon, he's put himself in that conversation to be the third senior uh, in this group. Let's move to the guys, as we just discussed, that have done just a tremendous job opening holes and really maybe the biggest reason they beat Clemson, that's the offensive line. We're going to go in order of how we expect them to be drafted. The first, Wyatt Davis. Yeah, and I'll be honest. Wyatt Davis, I think, has not had the season that um, a lot of us expected. Um, I, I think he, he's very good. Um, he's stopping power at contact. He's a very aware player. Uh, he's able to gain body position, tie up defenders. Where he struggles is when uh, a defender gets his edge uh, because he, he doesn't play very wide. And so if, if a defender is able to get his outside shoulder, then he has a little bit of trouble. And we've seen that this year. He's been, more, he's been on the ground more this year than I think uh, all of last year. Um, but it, nonetheless, he's a well-rounded player. He should start early in his NFL career. Um, I, I, I've talked to NFL scouts this week about him. They expect him to be drafted somewhere – between 30 and 50. Um, so maybe he's a late round or late first round guy, but more likely uh, early second. How about Josh Myers? Yeah, there's some around the league that actually like Myers more than Davis, just because they feel like Myers is a little more safe as a, as a prospect. Uh, you know, you don't see some of the up and down play. You see just a very consistent player, um, a guy that's strong at the point of attack. He's an instinctive blocker. Uh, you know, he's, you know, you look at this center class this year and there's, there's some quality centers. Um, you know, I don't know that there's a clear first round guy, but Josh Myers might be the best. He, he might be the, the first center drafted. He's got a good shot. Before the season, you said left tackle Thayer Munford need to stay healthy. He's done so. And I'm sure he's improved his stock. How much? Yeah, and he's really polarizing. Um, you know, talking to scouts about him, some say he's got a shot to maybe even get into the top 100 picks, you know, maybe even sneak into day two. Others, they see him as more of a late round player. So Thayer Munford's really a polarizing player. And I think it just comes down to uh, he has some balance issues versus speed that, that really show at times. But he's so long. He's so wide that he just finds a way to stay between defenders and the football. And as an offensive lineman, it doesn't need to look pretty. You're not being judged off of, you know, uh, you know, it's the, making it look as pretty as possible. Can you keep defenders from, you know, can you protect the pocket? Can you keep defenders from, uh, you know, getting to your quarterback? That's, that's the mission. And more times than not, that's what Munford's been able to do this year. So uh, he's a senior bowl guy. That's going to be a really important week for him in mobile. Um, and so it's, he's definitely been a key to Ohio state's run uh, these last few games. I'm told Chris Olave has an extreme desire to be a first-round pick and even a relatively high one. Wide receiver is maybe the most talented position in the upcoming draft. Mm -hmm. Do you see Olave getting into the first round? 
Yeah, he definitely has a chance. Uh, you know, it's hard to argue against the top three receivers this year. Jamar Chase from LSU, and then both of Alabama's guys, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddell. Uh, but after that, there's uh, some some split opinion on who's wide receiver four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, you know, there's th- some different names from Kadarius Toney at Florida, Rashad Bateman, Minnesota, um, you know, Terrace Marshall, LSU. There, there's no shortage of names that are kind of vying for that to be that that, that next uh, wide receiver off the board. Chris Olave is right there in that mix. Um, you know, he doesn't have the most impressive body type. He's a very uh, lean, muscled player, but his he's got such sweet feet. He is a route runner. He plays fast. And he's a guy that doesn't necessarily look like a burner. Like, you, you don't – you know, there are some guys, you know, your Ted Ginns of the world where that you just tell just a, a, a blazer just going to run by guys. Chris Olave doesn't necessarily, you know, play like that. But every time you look at him, he's getting past the secondary. He's getting past he's, – he's racing downfield and beating everybody down there. So he just has – he's a glider. He just has that smooth athleticism to him that is just really special because it's not like he's an athlete playing receiver. He's a, he's a wide receiver who's a very good athlete. And within the context of his route construction and his ability to create spacing – he understands how to use his feet, how to use his athleticism. And then as a, as a pass catcher, uh, above average uh, with his ball skills, he's very, very good at attacking, uh, tracking the ball and attacking at its highest point. Uh, the focus is uh, above average, so he, he can catch the ball away from his body. So Chris Olave is doing everything he can to put himself in that first round mix, no question. And how he performs on Monday night against Alabama's corners. Cause it, there's a good chance that no matter if he's facing Patrick Sertan or Josh Job, that'll be the toughest corner he faces all year. And so how he performs against uh, Alabama's talented corners uh, might go a long way to determining just where he stacks up with these other receivers. It was very encouraging against Clemson that Olave, Garrett Wilson, and Jameson Williams were all targeted on deep routes. All three separated with the ball in the air pretty considerably, which is usually a really good sign. All right, last offensive player I want to talk about is a guy who came in super heralded and has had a good career here and I think has a chance to ultimately be a pro bowler, Jeremy Ruckert. Absolutely. And I, I was kind of hoping that's who you were talking about because I I would lo- love to talk about him. I, I think he doesn't get enough mention as – uh, you know, one of uh, one of the more talented players on this offense. And part of it is it's because Ohio State just doesn't use their tight ends uh, as targets as pass- in the passing game. They use their tight ends quite a bit, uh, but a lot of his blockers. His, you know, the stat sheet doesn't look great. He's got 27 career catches, only 12 this year. But when they target him, he's been so impressive. He's got – he understands routes. I and mean, that, that touchdown that he had against Clemson where uh, in the red zone, he had to kind of take the – take the his defender out a little bit, bend the route before he came back in just to create that passing window. And field just put it on him perfectly uh, in between the safety and, and the cover and uh, cover man. But Ruckert's route was so good. He, his hands are reliable. Um, there's just so much to like about Ruckert as a blocker, as a pass catcher. I mean, I, I think you're right. Everything's there. All the ingredients are there for him to be a reliable pro at the next level. I don't, he, I don't think he's necessarily the same athlete that, you know, a Travis Kelsey is, but he's reliable. He's going to do everything that, uh, you know, you need him to do to, to be out there and be a reliable, uh, reliable pro. So yeah, I, I'm with you. Jeremy Ruckert is one of the more unsung uh, players and prospects on that Ohio State roster. Yeah. Let's move to the defensive side of the ball. Not as heralded a group as last year, obviously, when Chase Young and Jeffrey Okuda went in the top three. The most heralded player on the defense has kind of struggled, and that's Sean Wade. When you're out there on the corner, you're out there for everybody to see, and you're drawing the other team's best player on the perimeter. And he struggled at times. Mm-hmm. Why don't you assess where Wade is after his first year on the edge? It, it obviously has not gone well. I mean, I don't, you can't watch Ohio State's defense and say he's played, played well at outside corner. It's just, you can't do it. Uh, the tape says otherwise. And it's, it really makes him an enigma as a prospect because he was promising as uh, last year as a nickel, as an inside player, um, you know, some snaps at safety, as, um, you know, press uh, press nickel player. Um, very promising. But as an outside corner, 
he just does not look comfortable out there. His footwork's all over the place. Um, he's not recognizing routes. Spacing is a consistent issue. Um, you know, we saw it against Penn State. We saw it against Michigan State. We saw it against Clemson. I mean, it's on every single tape. Uh, and so what do you do with him as, as an evaluator? Um, you know, he's, he's shown that he really – you can't trust him as an outside corner, okay, but – is what he did last year enough to, uh, you know, feel good about him as an inside corner or as a safety? And so Sean Wade's, uh, it, it's there's a lot on the line for him every time he goes out there because he desperately needs to change the narrative around his uh, his prospects. And so, um, you know, he's a very talented player. Uh, but hopefully, you know, if he does declare, uh, I, you know, I, I, I would assume that he will, but I don't know if he does declare, I hope he goes to the senior bowl, um, and performs there. Cause that's something that could help him, uh, maybe, you know, just put some positive tape out there. That's what, that's what he needs more than anything. It's just a positive tape. Um, and you know, just good, I'm thinking about going back to that, uh, going back to that Michigan State tape. Like even that interception that he made, he was still out of position. It was just a bad ball. So uh, you know, even when there's been some positive things, it wasn't necessarily positive in the eyes of scouts. Um, so you know, Sean Wade desperately needs uh, to kind of uh, you know get some positive tape out there. And hey, maybe he'll be able to do that uh, against Alabama. I mean, that's it, it's it's hard to. Hard to say that he will because it's Alabama will be the toughest wide receivers and passing game that they've seen yet. And so, you know, it's a, just a huge test for him. And hopefully he's up for the challenge. Um, but regardless, just for him, hopefully he's able to put some more positive stuff out there before uh, we get the draft weekend. If you were going to choose a defensive MVP for Ohio State this year, I can make a strong argument. The defensive tackles, Haskell Garrett and Tommy Togiai should share the award. It's been a revelation. Does the NFL feel the same about this duo? They're really, really intriguing because it looked like defensive tackle might be uh, not not a strength of this defense. Uh, you know, earlier in the season because uh, of what you were losing and just the fact that I mean, Tokyo I was obviously I, I remember watching him on last year's tape. Uh, over the summer and the effort was what stood out more than anything. I was like, okay, you know, this, this might be a guy. And then Haskell Garrett, you know, coming back from, uh, you know, the, the near fatal gunshot wound. And, you know, he, he was a senior, but he wasn't necessarily considered a, a draftable guy. Well, he's changed that with how he's played. I mean, you know, he, he plays with lateral quickness. He plays with a, a radar for the football. Uh, he doesn't allow himself to get pushed around. He finds ways to get off blocks. Uh, so Haskell Garrett has been just really, really impressive. Uh, and then Togi, uh, he might have been the most impressive defensive player for Ohio State uh, against Clemson. And it doesn't always show up in the stat sheet or even when you're watching the game. But just when I went back to the tape and really focused on that defensive line, Togi was just so impactful. But the, the power at the point of attack – his active playing style. So he's stacking up blockers and just creating issues, forcing uh, the offensive game plan to change and, you know, the rhythm of what they have, what they have going. It, it just, it, it's so, so disruptive. Um, and, and so Togi is a guy that is, uh, his draft error is pointing North. No question. When I came out with my top 10 uh, at each position back in December, Togi I was on there for the top 10 defensive tackles and he could just continues to play better and better, better uh, the more we see him. So both these players uh, I think have exceeded maybe what we thought back in September. And that's, that's been a huge part of Ohio state success. Both those guys have been awesome. And like you said, the Haskell Garrett story is asking to be a lifetime movie here at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's finish with the linebackers. Really an interesting group of guys who feel like they've all been here since we were in about the 10th grade. Baron Browning, Pete Werner, Tuff Borland, the emergence of Justin Hilliard in year whatever is this six. <laughs> Which guys are pros? Where do you think they'll go? And you know, we talked a little bit about Hilliard off air. He's almost like Sermon in that just a meteoric rise in his last year. Yeah, and Hilliard has been such a great story. And, you know, when the Big Ten initially canceled the season, I, I felt – Hilliard was one of the first guys I thought about because, you know, he the injuries just ravaged his college career. And you just – you saw the little bit – when he was able to get on the field and you were able to, you know, see him, you saw the flashes of talent, but he just couldn't stay out there. 
and he was coming back healthy for his sixth year. And you thought, okay, you know, like this is, this is his chance. And unfortunately it was luckily it was taken away from him. And then when they came back, Hilliard went out there and especially when, you know, they didn't have Baron Browning and he was at Northwestern game, I believe. Uh, yeah. Hilliard went out there and just looked like he was a, he's been starting there the last three years. I mean, he, he looked like he was, uh, a, a polished veteran who you know, belonged and was, you know, one of the big reasons they were able to win that game. So I, I think that Baron Browning will be the first drafted of this group. Um, you know, he's just, the physical traits have always been there. Uh, the rest is, you know, it's catching up. Uh, he needs to continue and improve his anticipation, but he's, he has gotten better and better in, in that area. The athleticism, I mean, he can make plays in coverage. He can string out runs. He can mirror. He can uh, blitz and make plays as, as uh, you know, in the backfield. So Baron Browning, to me, I, I think he'll be the first of these of that, that group drafted for the Buckeyes, probably somewhere top 75. Uh, Pete Werner shortly after that. Uh, I mean, the key with him is just the versatility. He has the athleticism where he can play the Sam. He can play the Mike. He can play uh, more of an outside will position, uh, more of an overhang guy. Um, he can blitz, he can drop. I mean, he can do so many things and the intelligence, I mean, you talk to the coaches about him, and they say that his athleticism and his smarts that allows us to just put more and more on his plate every single week. And him, that, that's, that, that versatility is going to be key for him. Uh, I think he's going to be a solid pro for a long, I don't, I don't know that he's ever going to be like a pro bowler or, you know, a hundred tackle guy, but I think he's just going to be a solid pro for a long time, special teams, and then on defense as well. Um, you know, tough Borland, I, th I think he's more in the later round conversation, um, just not the type of athlete that, uh, you know, you're looking for. But uh, could he survive, uh, you know, standing out on special teams or things like that? Yeah, he absolutely could. Hilliard, you just you hope the, the medicals come back good enough that he can uh, – I don't know that he's going to get drafted, but, you know, hopefully the medicals are good enough that he can get into a camp and carve out a, a some type of NFL career before, uh, you know, his time is done. I think Hilliard would be much better off having his medical reports get lost in the mail. But um, Yeah, let's, probably. Let, let's pick it now. We are several days away, assuming Monday night goes off without a hitch. Ohio State versus Alabama for all the marbles. Dane Brugler's pick is as follows. Hmm. It, it's so tough because, um, you know, uh, the Alabama is going to be able to score, uh, you know, against that Ohio State secondary. Um, I don't know that because the uh, Alabama offensive line, even without Landon Dickerson, is so much better than Clemson's offensive line. So what kind of what kind of success will that Ohio State defensive line have against the offensive line? That's going to be a big factor here. Um, I, I do think that Alabama is going to score a lot of points and can Justin Fields do what he did against Clemson and, you know, put up 40 plus points. Cause I, it might take that in order to win. So I'm going to go with, uh, I'm not going to make Ohio state fans happy with me. I'm going to go with, uh, you know, a 42 to 36 type of, uh, type of score with Alabama, just squeaking it out. Um, but it, the key for Ohio State is bending but not breaking, uh, you know, forcing, uh, you know, you're going to give up some big plays, but make them kick field goals, you know, instead of scoring those touchdowns. If Ohio State's going to win, that's going to be the, the key to that. And if they're able to, you're not going to maybe win as much as you did in the trenches like you did against Clemson. But as long as you, you know, it, you know, when you get punched in the mouth, you punch right back and it's kind of an even battle. That's going to be the key for Ohio State. So and I just I cannot wait for Fields. I can't emphasize that enough. How Justin Fields performs in this game is going to carry a lot of weight with how scouts view him uh, going to the next level. So I, I just cannot wait for this matchup. Should be a lot of fun. Two items of positivity for our Buckeyes here. One, I watched Ole Miss and Florida move up and down the field. Yeah. Neither one of those offenses is as good as Ohio State. There's no more games for Justin Fields after this. Mm -hmm. So he can run anytime he wants. Every single game he's played in the back of your mind, you've been like, well, we can't get, he can't get her. He can run with reckless abandon now. So I do think that is a advantage for Ohio State. Yeah, and I will, hey, I will say this. Mac Jones said that Ohio State's defense uh, will be the best they've played all year. And, you know, I'm sure some of that is 
respecting your opponent and lip service and not wanting to give Ohio state any, you know, bulletin board material, um, you know, like, uh, like the Saban family, but ha. I, you know, Mac Jones, I mean, the, to say that about Ohio state's defense is saying a lot, uh, considering some of the defenses they, they faced in the sec. So uh, that a lot of, you know, Alabama is not taking that Ohio state defense lightly and, and they shouldn't with the, especially with the way they played against Clemson. So that that's going to be a matchup. That's maybe a little, it'd be a little tougher than, than we thought a couple weeks ago. I cannot express to you how appreciative I am of Dane. He is a highly coveted commodity on the air these days. And for him to give us this much time, truly exceptional Dane, we appreciate it. And we will talk to you soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Dan. All right. Brandon Huffman with 24 seven sports here with the nation's number one prospect in the 2021 class, JT Tuimolo out of Eastside Catholic high school in Sammamish, Washington, Jay, thanks for joining us tonight and uh, coming on the 24-7 Sports Recruiting Podcast. Thank you for having me. So you had a pretty eventful early signing period. While a lot of guys made their decisions, you narrowed your list down to five schools, Alabama, Ohio State, Oregon, USC, and Washington. You still have a few weeks, at least maybe a few months until you're ready to make a decision, but just getting it down to a top five, was that still, and essentially a final five, was that still a pretty tough process for you? Yes, it was. Uh, it, it was a lot of talking with the family and uh, just really, really analyzing each and every college and uh, to see who was going to be kept and who were going to, uh, you know, take out from that, from my starting seven. But yeah, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a long process, and uh, I think we just wanted to take our time and make sure that these were the five we we're going to go with. So we'll talk about the three Pac-12 schools that are in your top five first. Uh, the first school that we'll talk about, University of Washington, they offered you over three years ago. I think it was, what, three weeks into your freshman year in high school, and they made your final five. What was it about the Huskies that had them included in your final five? You know, ever since they offered me from – well, pretty much being my first offer – for both football and basketball, but for football, you know, during that whole, during the, my whole year, you know, they've always been just keeping up with me. They never, you know, never stopped staying in contact with me. They're always, I built a good relationship with uh, Coach Lake and before Coach Lake it was Coach Pete, but, uh, you know, getting to know all of the, all of the staff, all the coaching staff for UW made it easier when the transition came, when uh, Coach Lake went to, went to be the head coach. So it was just a strong bond strong bond between me and the coaching staff and everybody over there at, at UW. The next school that offered you, I think it was a couple weeks after the Washington offer, was USC. And I know you got some family ties down to Southern California. You grew up watching USC. What was it about the Trojans that put them in the final five? It was, a, uh, I would say, started off strong, but then they went through the whole new coaching staff and, uh, you know, uh, getting to talk to them and knowing what they're bringing in and the mindset they're coming in with, you know, really – but it was an eye opener for me for them to come back in with the old U USC mindset when the Reggie Bush and all of them were back there coming in with that that mindset to make that program great again was a like I said a great eye opener and also getting to talk to coach Coach Vic and uh, like what he's doing and what he's bringing to the table and also what uh, Coach Helton too. Oregon was the other Pac-12 school that was in your top five. You visited them last fall, uh, back when fans were still allowed to go to games, back in 2019. Uh, yeah. But the Ducks made your final five. What was it about Oregon that you included them in that final group? Man, basically what they're building. I know I say that a lot, but they're bringing back the tradition, uh, that Oregon tradition when uh, Chip Kelly used to be there, and uh, what they're creating over there. Coach Mark Cristobal is bringing what he learned from – SEC from Bama and bringing it to the Pac-12 and trying to create something over there. And I like what he's like, what he's doing, what he's building. The summer between your freshman and sophomore year, you went down to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. You had a viral clip down there. And a couple of minutes after you, you had that clip, you got an offer from Nick Saban. And that was when you went down to that camp and you beat a guy who was in the top 100 pretty handily. And if folks remember that tweet or that that video that Tracy Ford tweeted out, you could see Tosh LePoy, who was the defense coordinator at the time, trying to hide a smile and a little laugh as you worked that offensive lineman. Alabama is one of your five finalists. What is it about the tide that has them this far along in your recruitment? Man, you know, getting able to talk to Coach Nick Saban a lot, you know, having picking his brain and him picking mine and just being able to talk to Coach Roach, too, on the D-line staff. But, man, the culture that Bama has, is it's always been up there. 
you know, and uh, getting to talk to Coach Saban more and more frequently or more than any other coach on that coach staff is just, you know, he's always been, he has a history and, uh, you know, that, and I like what he's doing and he, what he's continued to doing up there at Bama. Ohio State, the last school that made your top five. In fact, uh, of the five schools that you had in your final five, Ohio State's the only one you haven't actually been able to visit, but you've got some ties there with your former teammate at Eastside Catholic with G. Scott Jr., a freshman there, and then another one of your friends in the 2021 class, Emeka Egbuka, having just signed there. What is it about the Buckeyes that had them here in your final five? Coach Larry Johnson, you know, he has a history. He's put a lot of dudes in the league at my position in a – you know, watching, watching him, watching film with him, my film and other D linemen's film. You know, he knows what he's talking about, and he's been doing this for a long time. And uh, being able to talk to Coach Day, pretty much those two, those are the two coaches I talk to more. You know, they're just great. I built a strong, built a strong bond with the both of them. And uh, you know, Coach Larry Johnson is is considered one of the top at his at what he's doing. And uh, he's had a history, and I I was able to watch it when they played Penn State. When Saquon Barkley was there, so from that point moving forward, I always loved what uh, what Ohio State had. All five of your finalists either won their division or their conference this year. Washington winning the Pac-12 North, USC winning the Pac-12 South, Oregon winning the Pac-12, Alabama winning the SEC, Ohio State winning the Big Ten. Two of those schools are playing in what a couple of your your seven on seven coaches called the other night the JT Bowl, and that's the national championship game with Ohio State against Alabama. And obviously both teams had impressive performances in the Rose Bowl and in the Sugar Bowl. But what were your thoughts watching Ohio State and Alabama on New Year's Day and just seeing the performances both those teams had, knowing that they're going to play each other? What did you think about each of those schools in their bowl games? They were really dominant. Uh, they all are dominant in their own ways. Uh, you know, Bama, you know, going, they used to be really known for running, but now they got a good air raid with Devontae Smith and actually he just won Heisman. So they have a, they have a good all around offense and defense. Same with uh, Ohio State. You know, they got a powerful runner with Trey Sermon and uh, they're both really good at running the ball. Bama's really good at running the ball with Najee Harris. So, you know, it's a good, it's going to be a good matchup. They're very well talented all over the field. You know, they displayed why they should be in this championship game yeah they're they're really talented and dominant uh in their own ways and I feel like it's gonna be a really good game between them when you watch Ohio State play obviously Haskell Garrett and Tommy Togiai are two uh, Polynesian players that have had that were Polynesian player of the year candidates um, both played in the Poly Bowl which you were selected to play in you know when you when you see a guy like Tommy Togiai who's from the Northwest and him flourishing at Ohio State you know, is that something that, that you – between him and then G. Scott, now Mecca going there, are you seeing a little bit of a Northwest to Columbus pipeline starting to open up a little bit? And now that you say that, I feel like, you know, I feel like when the Northwest is starting to be put on the map everywhere, you know, like you said, those three dudes doing their thing or two dudes, you know, G's up there doing his thing and Tommy's dominating. Uh, I think it's starting to come well known that Northwest has a – has a lot of talent too. Going down to Alabama, obviously you, you had the experience down there at that camp. You know, when you were there, obviously Tua Tonga Valoa had, I think, just thrown the walk-off touchdown pass a few months before and was really starting to make, you know, his way felt in Tuscaloosa. And later that year was the starter on a team that made it to the national championship game. And, and you see that, you know, Alabama is making a bigger push out West with Najee Harris there uh, with Tua before with Bryce Young on the roster. Clearly Alabama is recruiting the West, but they haven't really hit the Northwest as hard. You know, is that something that, you know, coach Saban and even when, when Sark was there recruiting, was that something that they talked about maybe starting to open up a little bit of a pipeline in the Northwest? Getting to talk to them a lot, you know, being from the Northwest. And like I said, we're overlooked in a lot of ways, but I think this time we, we've got, I think this is one of the best classes for both football and basketball coming out of the Northwest. So I think it's just now starting to be known that the Northwest has some, has some ball players too. And, you know, I think that's grabbing attention from a lot of coaches. Like you said, Bam was a big name. I don't remember the last time they looked out here in Pacific Northwest, but, you know, it's good that we're grabbing attention now from, you know, everywhere all around the country. When you look at this national championship game, you've got Ohio State, you got Alabama, and those are two of the schools that are in your final five. Did you ever envision when you were in middle school, when you were at the FBU All-American game, 
as a freshman down in San Antonio or when you were playing as a middle schooler that, you know, two of your five finalists would be two of the more prominent programs in college football that were playing for a national championship? Like, did you ever think that a kid from, you know, the suburbs of Seattle would have an opportunity to pick from five division champions or conference champions, but two of them playing for the national championship? I never thought I would be in this position. Really a true blessing. You know, it was always a dream to think about it. You know, I have always would sit in front of the couch or sit in front of the TV, watch the games, and just, you know, always be like, man, I wonder what it feels to have an offer or to get it just picked from one of these teams. But now living in it, looking back at it, I was just always dream. Never knew if it was going to come true or not. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad I, you know, stayed working, kept my head low, stay humbled, stay grounded in a, you know, now I have, I'm in a true blessing and God-giving position where I have, uh, you know, options to choose from. And most of them are really good, really good programs. The 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast will be right back with more after this break. We're here with JT Tuimolova, the number one player in the country, according to 24-7 Sports in 2021. You know, Jay, it's been an interesting year. You look at some of the players that are in your class. They got to play their senior season. Some states had a state championship 14-game season, and you're in a state that you're not even sure when your football season or when your basketball season is going to start. You were invited to the All-American Bowl. You were the first player invited to the Polynesian Bowl. Both those games ended up falling victim to the COVID pandemic. You know, how have you kept yourself just optimistic and kept a positive outlook on things when you've lost two of the most important and monumental games that a high school football player could be invited to? You haven't been able to take those visits and you haven't even been able to play your season. How have you tried to keep a positive outlook considering all that's gone away this year? Man, I would say, you know, with both of these bowl games being canceled, it gives me more time to prepare for you know, the next year going into college, being able to get my body ready and uh, just buckle down on the things I struggled with over these past seasons and uh, just fix all the little mistakes. And uh, on top of that, get a chance to spend time with family because I know when school was around, plus all the traveling, it was really, there was really little time. There's very little time I had to spend with the family, just sit down and talk with them or just, just go places with them. So, I feel like it was a it was a blessing in disguise, you know. Allowed me to work and continue to work on my craft, you know. Also, get a lot of time with with my family over here. You've been getting up at six thirty, six in the morning, going to FSP and training and working out with some of the other guys in your class. You were out at the FSP alumni game this weekend, uh, playing seven on seven in a, in a driving rain. You still were doing some <laughs> AAU hoops a couple of weeks ago. But how hungry are you to get back on the field and put that Eastside Catholic helmet on, put that Eastside Catholic basketball jersey on? How much has this offseason training just really motivated you to get back out there? And, you know, I know one of the things that's been driving you is you want to get that basketball ring to match the football yeah. and basketball ring your, your good friend Paulo Banchero has. How hungry are you to get back out on the hardwood or on the football field? Really motivated with training and putting all the work I've been doing with my trainers and with – couple of my other brothers you know it just just wants me to get back on that field and see see what uh all this training has done and uh just see what I've worked on and uh you know use it use it in a live game but man I really miss it <laughs> when I put on that the uniform for our all-american pictures you know I was just running around the whole field just getting the field back what it feels like to get ready before uh before a game and warm up and just have your pads and helmets on but yeah, man, training and all this has really motivated me to get back on that field and put a lot of things I've learned from a lot of NFL players and a lot of players in my grade and uh, put it to use. Lastly, I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you pick a winner of the national championship game because that would be unfair. But what I am going to ask is, do you and your family, I know you guys have taken a very deliberate approach to the recruiting process and, you know, you, you've never rushed anything. You've taken your time with the whole process. Do you guys have kind of a loose time frame of when you'd like to have a decision made or is everything still kind of up in the air just in terms of when you'll get a chance to actually visit these schools with the NCAA dead period or have you started to say, hey, you know, let's try to get a decision by this certain date? Uh, we haven't came up with a certain date yet. We would like to see if they open up visits, not only if I'm comfortable, but also with my family to see if we're 
all set on the right school. But uh, right now it's up in the air. Probably going to see and see what they do with letting people or letting at student athletes visit to check out the schools. Or But, yeah, right now it's up in the air. Don't know yet. All right, Jay. Well, you got a very bright future ahead of you. A lot of good opportunities, a lot of good options. And, you know, you still got some time left in this recruiting process. So even though – you would have been in San Antonio last week. We would be going to Paula, to the Polynesian Bowl in Hawaii in a couple of weeks. Instead, we're getting this driving rain here in Seattle. I know it's not as uh, tropical as, as we could have seen in Hawaii, but I know it's something that, you know, you're, you're like you said, you're enjoying that time with your family. I know how much your family means to you and how much uh, you enjoy spending time with them and having your siblings a part of the process. So enjoy those last couple of weeks and months as a uncommitted recruit with the family and you know we look forward to, to your final decision thank you thank you for having me he's the number one player in the country the highest rated player to ever come from the state of washington jt tumolo out of Eastside catholic in sammamish washington and he still has a couple more weeks if not months left in the recruiting process but stay tuned into 24 7 sports we will have all the latest from jt